welcome. We're glad to have you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we missed um, hearing that intro. I'm going to um, assume we should be grateful for it. <laughs> but um, thank you so much, everybody, for having us here today. We certainly wanted to be there in person, at least some of us, but um, weather and just other obligations weren't cooperative. This is one of the issues with being an organization that serves the whole state of Minnesota is that there's a lot of geography to navigate <clears throat> if we want to be in person. Um, but so I'm Brenna Dahani. Um, I serve as board chair for Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate. And today we're really happy to share with you how we are working to tackle climate change as a health emergency. Um, I wanted to actually start off with a question for you all today. And unfortunately, since we're not interactive, um, you'll just have to keep your answers to yourself. Maybe we can discuss it a little bit at the end. Um, but recently we had the opportunity to go to the Midwest Climate Resilience Conference in Duluth. And when we think about oh, you resilience- can just, You can just take the car. Oh, we're hearing somebody. Um, I'm not sure. They're so you could... caller from the room. But maybe there's somebody who could mute. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so we were at the uh, Midwest Climate Resilience Conference. And resilience to us as health professionals, we have to think about resilience from a mental health standpoint. And so we asked participants um, at our exhibit table there, what helps you stay resilient in the face of climate anxiety and climate grief? And for all of us at HPHC and over one third of the folks who participated and added things to this interactive board to answer that question, um, resilience came in the form of gathering with like-minded people and taking action. And so we definitely see that as an important resilience strategy when we're facing the climate crisis. And so that's kind of the focus of what we wanted to share with you today is what are we doing in gathering together and taking action on climate change um, to build resilience in these ways. Um, so Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate is an organization that does what the name would suggest. We are health professionals of all kinds um, in the state of Minnesota, and we you know, advocate for climate solutions. So we um, particularly uh, educate health professionals about these health impacts of climate change and move people towards action um, in their own spheres of influence, whether that's in clinical practice or taking action in public advocacy. And so we're gonna kind of talk to you about those three different spheres of action today. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit more about our educational arm. Um, so one of the things that we have done um, since our inception in 2015 is to uh, hold conferences, biannual conferences under this moniker of Code Blue for Patient Earth. Um, we had an in-person conference in 2018. Um, 2020, we were going to have an in-person conference. I'm sure everybody knows why that fell through. <laughs> in 2022, we had a webinar-based conference, and um, there's a QR code and a link here to the, all the videos from that conference that are available for anybody to tune into to learn more. Um, and we actually featured this idea of resilience in that 2022 conference. Um, we're gearing up now in 2024 to have a webinar series that will also continue to talk more about climate justice and other issues on climate health. So stay tuned for that if it's of interest to you. Other things we do are informal climate convos. We also have a YouTube um, playlist of all the climate convos we've had in the past. So these are kind of informal discussions, maybe kind of like what your Tuesday group does. Um, we also do advocacy skills development for our uh, health professionals. We engage in a happy hour to kick off the legislative session every year. Uh, we've also done some webinar-based skills development recently. And we started this year a Climate and Health Equity Leaders Fellowship, where we actually have a group of seven health professionals who are getting a one-to-one -one mentored experience to learn how they can move from um, being concerned about climate change to taking action through uh, independent projects of their own interest and are getting a really dense curriculum about the health impacts of climate change and engaging in health equity organizing. Um, we also put out different types of educational modalities. We produced a short um, animated educational video about the health impacts of air pollution meant to educate both health professionals and the public. And just recently um, had a research paper published where we evaluated whether this was um, efficient and effective as an educational intervention. Um, spoiler alert, our research found that it was in fact highly effective at increasing knowledge and confidence in engaging and counseling patients about the health impacts of air pollution. 
So you're welcome to check out the link both to that educational video and to the research paper um, on this topic. Um, we also produce reports and fact sheets. This is one that we're very proud of, a report about climate justice and public health um, in Minnesota. So there's a QR code and a link to that if you're interested in learning more about moving from understanding um, why the climate change is a social justice issue and um, what we can do about it from a health standpoint. So um, then kind of the last thing that we're doing is we think it's very important that we transform everything in health professional education to where climate change and planetary health are recognized as um, something that's integral um, to what health professionals need to know to be able to effectively um, protect and improve health for now and future generations. And so we're working wherever we have some institutional influence um, to try to develop and push for curriculum integration. Um, so I personally work at the medical school Duluth campus as a postdoctoral associate and have helped uh, work with students um, and colleagues to develop um, curriculum on climate change that will hopefully continue to be integrated. Um, I'm going to pass the baton here to our policy director, Kathleen Schuler, to talk to you about the work that we do in the realm of policy advocacy. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Kathleen Schuler, as Brenna uh, introduced me, and I'm a retired public health professional, and I'm really enjoying the work that I'm doing with Health Professionals for Healthy Climate. I wish we could have been there in person. Uh, we are definitely going to plan to come to Ely in the spring, and we look forward to meeting all of you in person. We have a policy advocacy committee that meets the third Tuesday of the month from 6.30 to 7.30. If you would like to join us in these virtual meetings, um, you can email me. My email's there. Um, oh, that's right. I, you have to, <laughs> I have to tell Brenda to pass the... Uh, to forward the slides. So climate change is health emergency, as Brenna pointed out. And we utilized a, a declaration that we put together for Minnesota. It was based on a declaration that the American Lung Association developed at the national level. And we invited health professional organizations in Minnesota to sign on to this declaration. And we've got doctors, nurses, um, doctors for health equity, public health, uh, a, uh, a variety of health professionals who signed on to this. And we did also add a health equity lens because we feel like climate justice is very important to solving the climate crisis. Next slide. Um, so there, the, there are benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We need to phase out fossil fuels, which is the major source of air pollution, which causes premature deaths and it also contributes to heart disease and other uh, and other health conditions. Uh, the the there, there's benefits that can be quantified from reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and the Inflation Reduction Act, which invested 369 billion in climate action, and is is going to contribute to reducing greenhouse gases 40 percent by 2030, would prevent. 3,600 premature deaths, 100,000 asthma attacks, and 400,000 lost work days. There's also investments in environmental justice communities so that they can become resilient in dealing with the climate crisis. Um, another bill that we passed this year was 100% clean energy by 2040. And that bill is projected to actually save 1.2 billion in avoided healthcare costs. Next slide, please. So this legislative session you're probably familiar with uh, was a highly successful in terms of climate action. In 2023, we passed the 100% clean energy bill. We updated our climate goals to reach uh, carbon free by 2050. Uh, we invested in solar on schools, weatherization, um, a number of programs that are really gonna contribute toward reaching that 100% goal and move Minnesota to a carbon free future. Next slide, please. I'm gonna highlight a couple of the policies that we are working on. The Minnesota legislature passed the cumulative impacts law, and this law is designed 
to rectify or begin to rectify some of the disproportionate impacts that we're seeing in Minnesota. Um, it requires that the Miss Minnesota Pollution Control Agency consider the cumulative impacts of pollution in an environmental justice community. So they identified an EJ community as a community that has a higher proportion of low-income people, of people of color, and also people with limited English language proficiency. And they have identified in the law that the metro area, Duluth and Rochester are EJ communities. We know that there are more than that, but those were the designated ones in the law. And it's designed to reduce pollution burden in these communities. So when an industry comes in and they want an air permit, the pollution control agency will require that company to do a cumulative impacts analysis. And we know that there are disproportionate impacts based on the higher pollution in EJ communities because we've cited highways, we've cited industries in these communities um, historically as, as a racial injustice. And in Minnesota, we know communities of color have higher rates of asthma, infant and maternal mortality, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and chronic illness. So we hope that as this bill uh, gets implemented through rulemaking that we will be able to rectify some of those disproportionate impacts. And I will put um, some links in the chat if you want to follow the MPCA and also the Frontline Communities Protection Coalition who is working on this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other issue that we're working on is electric school buses. We are partnering with the Coalition for Clean Transportation and MN350 to support deployment of electric school buses. And the legislature has allocated 13 million for a grant program that the Department of Commerce is going to be rolling out in 2024. Uh, we're also telling school districts about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, $5 billion in federal funding over five years. Next slide, please. Um, why are we why are we promoting electric school buses? So we know that most kids ride to school on a diesel bus. Um, there are some propane bus buses out there as well. But diesel buses expose kids to harmful emissions that contribute to asthma attacks and long-term health effects. Uh, we can reduce exposure to diesel exhaust and improve children's health and reduce absenteeism. There are studies out there that actually demonstrate this. There are also studies that demonstrate that cleaner buses contribute to test score gains for kids in English language and math. Electric school buses also uh, reduce uh, CO2 emissions. So an electric school bus has zero tailpipe emissions. And if it's charged on a clean energy, renewable energy grid, then it has zero CO2 emissions. Uh, electric school buses cost a little bit more, but we know that schools that, that have these save money in the long run. Michigan schools have saved $4,000 to $11,000 per year in fuel and maintenance costs. And right now, school districts have an opportunity to apply for the federal and state funding to improve uh, health and academics in their schools. Next slide. So to learn more about this, if you're a parent, an interested citizen, a student, and you want to uh, learn more about how you can advocate for electric school buses with your school district. We have two webinars coming up on November 30th and December 14th. So please join. And we also have a fact sheet um, that's available to talk about the health benefits. Next slide. We belong to a number of coalitions, a coalition for clean, clean transportation, the 100% campaign um, and several others. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail of all of these, but um, can we? Uh, can I see the next slide, Brenna? So, why are we doing this work, and why is it important to phase out fossil fuels? A healthy climate future does not include fossil fuels. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC says the continued installation of unabated fossil fuel infrastructure will lock in greenhouse gas emissions. And this air pollution caused by fossil fuels is responsible for 350,000 premature deaths in the United States each year. 
Uh, and we can prevent these deaths and we can prevent hospitalizations, ER visits, crop losses, uh, instances of dementia by keeping our global warming down to the two degree centigrade pathway. But we also need to be aware of false and flawed climate solutions that keep fossil fuels around. Next slide. So a couple of things that we're working on, I wanted to talk about. Um, false climate solutions, according to the new energy economy, are technological or market-based schemes promoted by fossil fuel companies and their political allies to give the appearance of meaningful climate action while actually functioning to delay effective policies that might challenge their power, control, or profits. So when we're looking at climate solutions, we need to ask ourselves these five questions, which we developed in collaboration with our colleagues at CURE and Sierra Club and some legislators. We need to ask, what are the greenhouse gases that are gonna be reduced? How much greenhouse gas? What is the amount? Can we measure that? Are, is this solution part of a zero emissions future or is it a dead end pathway? Are there better alternatives? What are the impacts on air, water, land, and health, and who benefits? If the fossil fuel industry benefits, then we should be skeptical about that solution. We are part of a clean transportation standards work group because Minnesota has considered a low carbon fuel standard as one of the possible solutions. And the low carbon fuel standard is gets very complicated and I don't have time to explain it in detail, but basically it requires that, that fuel producers measure their carbon intensity and reduce their carbon intensity over time. However, it builds on the current fossil fuel infrastructure and extends the life of liquid fuel because right now, most of us, unless we have an electric vehicle, we fuel our vehicles with the gasoline ethanol mix. Um, it also continues ethanol in the mix, which creates air, water pollution, and soil degradation. Um, it also depends on CO2 pipelines to reduce carbon intensity. CO2 pipelines are, are designed to capture the, the CO2 at the ethanol production site and then transport it to another location where it is used mostly in enhanced oil recovery. Uh, next slide, please. The IPCC has, has looked at different solutions to the climate crisis and how many greenhouse gases they actually reduce and what is the cost of reducing those greenhouse gases. And we can see uh, in this graphic that the carbon capture utilization and storage, which is the carbon pipelines, it costs more and it reduces fewer greenhouse gases. If we actually looked to uh, supporting active transit uh, and electric vehicles um, and public transit, those are solutions that actually reduce more greenhouse gases and at a lower cost than market strategies like carbon capture. Next slide, please. Um, why is this issue important? Um, I would recommend, I don't know if you've heard a presentation on this before, but I would recommend that you go to CURE's website. They have a lot of information on this. Carbon capture and storage uses pipelines to capture the CO2 at a refinery, power plant, or industrial site and puts it in a pipeline and takes it to another site. 90% of it is used for enhanced oil recovery. So basically, this is fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, our current experience with this, uh, with this methodology is that it it actually is expensive, it's energy and water intensive, and it underperforms in terms of actual sequestering of CO2. It also creates air and water pollution and land disturbance. And it diverts necessary funds from effective climate pollution solutions and squanders precious water and energy resources. There are also health and safety issues with pipelines, which we're very concerned about. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to close the, the policy section of the presentation by talking about the fossil-free non-proliferation treaty that HPHC has signed on to. Um, air pollution causes 7 million premature deaths per year and contributes to other health conditions. Um, and the climate crisis, largely caused by burning fossil fuels, threatens our health and also threatens healthcare systems. Joe's going to talk more about um, healthcare systems. 
So we need to fast track real solutions to ensure a just transition for every worker, community, um, and every person so that we can reach a sustainable future. And we also must respect indigenous rights and the rights of local communities as we, as we develop our climate solutions. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to go through these slides kind of quickly. In addition to our education work and our policy work, we also su support community groups um, largely in the metro area. We also have, have worked with um, tribal groups and other groups working on stopping Line 3. We have a long history of organizing against Line 3. Unfortunately, um, Line 3 is in the ground and it's still continuing to create harm. Uh, next slide, please. So these are just a couple of examples of work. We work with community members for environmental justice in North Minneapolis and U of M medical students uh, organized a environmental justice tour looking at some of the pollution sites and learning about uh, what the community is concerned about in their, in their community. Uh, next slide. We're also working with the Minnesota Environmental Justice Table to shut down the Hurricane Incinerator, which is an important uh, significant use, I'm um, sorry, significant source of pollution within North Minneapolis and uh, downtown area in Minneapolis. Next slide. So media, this this will be really quick. Uh, we, we really feel it's important to get the voices of health professionals out there. Uh, we are credible spokespeople and a couple of examples of media that we have been successful at publishing um, Dr. Dan Trajano, who is a retired physician and a member of HPHC, and Brooke Roper, who is a parent with a child with asthma. Um, they got a, a really great article in Duluth News Tribune talking about the benefits of electric school buses. And a couple more examples, uh, Balitha Serapanini, who's a physician um, with the U of M, Fairview, and she's an expert on air pollution and, and spoke with uh, Angela Davis on NPR. And then finally, Teddy Potter, who's one of the founders um, of HPHC, talking about extreme heat and how it affects our health. So um, that concludes my presentation. I'll pass it off to Joe. Thanks, Kathleen. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having us today. Lovely to chat with you, even though it's through a screen. Uh, my name is Joe Bjorgard. I'm a nurse by background, and I'm a board member of Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate. And I work within my health system and consult with other healthcare systems to strategize and develop sustainability solutions and prepare the healthcare workforce and communities to respond to the health impact of climate change. And I'm going to talk to you about climate smart healthcare. The objectives are to discuss the healthcare sector's contribution to climate change, describe why health professionals are so important in this work. Um, I'll share some climate smart solutions, present a case study of a nurse led environmental sustainability initiative, and I'll share some resources to guide climate action in the healthcare sector. Next slide. Awesome. So what is the healthcare sector's contribution to climate change and why do we need to take action to develop climate smart healthcare? Well, the healthcare industry is responsible for about 4.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions and about 8.5% of annual U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Our report from Healthcare Without Harm in 2019 showed that if the healthcare sector were a country, it would be the fifth largest contributor to climate change globally. Our guiding healthcare organizations, such as the National Academy of Medicine, American Nurses Association, and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, have acknowledged that this is an urgent issue and are urging health professionals to take action. They're also developing tools and programs to assist health professionals in doing this work. And additionally, our regulatory bodies, such as the Joint Commission, have developed goals for decarbonization of the healthcare sector. And it's really only a matter of time before the goals become mandates. The Joint Commission has also developed a certification for sustainable health systems as an incentive to decarbonize. So you can see that healthcare systems that are responsible for caring for and protecting human health are also part of the problem, but there is an urgent call for action 
to address the problem and many resources that are accessible. This slide shows some of the ways that healthcare contributes to climate change. Um, so we use around the clock energy in our ORs and for lighting in our inpatient units. Um, we of course have waste anesthetic gases that are one of the top contributors of greenhouse gas emissions in healthcare settings. Um, we procurement of food and food transport um, is another contributor to climate change, as well as employee commutes, waste hauling, treatment, and disposable disposal, and of course, um, the procurement of supplies and materials. Next slide, please. So why should health professionals lead this work? Um, well, many of us are um, accountable within our Hippocratic Oath and our Code of Ethics to do no harm. And part of that is preventing the harm um, that the environmental impacts of the healthcare sector have on human health. We're also trusted messengers, um, especially a call out to nurses here being um, the most trusted professionals, according to Gallup polls, several years in a row. Um, we're on the front lines of where the waste is generated in the healthcare sector. So we can really do that frontline work of reducing the waste. And we're also some of the first people to observe the health impacts of climate change in our patients and communities. And we're natural collaborators and systems thinkers. Next slide, please. So in my work to address climate change and environmental sustainability within healthcare, within the healthcare sector and beyond, my approach is through a lens of planetary health. For those of you who aren't familiar with this term, planetary health is an emerging and growing transdisciplinary field and social movement aimed at studying and addressing the degradation of our planet's natural systems and the resulting disruptions to humanity and all living things. Climate change is one disruption that we're experiencing globally. And I also wanna mention the Sao Paulo Declaration for Planetary Health because it provides guidance for the healthcare sector. It was developed by global leaders in the planetary health community and reads as follows. Reorient all aspects of health systems toward planetary health from procurement, energy sources, healthcare efficiency to waste reduction. Commit to achieving a nature positive carbon neutral healthcare system before 2040 while strengthening healthcare systems resilience to global environmental changes. Disease prevention, health promotion, and health equity must be at the heart of this transition. Incorporate health perspectives and traditions beyond traditional Western methods, including traditional knowledges led by Indigenous peoples, as well as other integrative health practices. Consider social and ecological determinants of health for both individuals and communities, including public and active transportation, access to healthcare facilities, green spaces to provide social, recreational, and mental health benefits, air, soil, and water control, and access to affordable, nutritious diets, particularly for lower income communities, and advocate for public access to culturally appropriate health services as a human right. So you can see the planetary health really brings a broader and more holistic scope to climate smart healthcare. Next slide, please. So how can we tackle some of these contributions to climate change and minimize the environmental footprint of healthcare? I'm gonna share some solutions. Next slide. So we'll start with anesthetic gases. Emissions from volatile anesthetic gases account for more than half of total emissions from the OR and perioperative setting within healthcare systems. About 4 million tons of the global healthcare sector's greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed to these anesthetic gases, as well as meter dose inhalers. Some anesthetic agents are more harmful to the environment than others. Desflurane and nitrous oxide have the highest global warming potential compared to other anesthetic gases. So some solutions are reducing carbon emissions related to anesthetic gases through altering choice of anesthetic agent. For example, eliminating or reducing desflurane and nitrous oxide and transitioning to other agents that are maybe less harmful like sevofluorine and isofluorine. Reducing flat Fresh flow gas rate is another high impact solution, 
as well as oftentimes hospitals have central nitrous oxide pipelines that pipe central nitrous oxide into operating rooms. Um, these have been shown to have a pretty continuous leak where a very significant amount of nitrous oxide is wasted to the environment. Um, so there's a general recommendation to decommission central nitrous tanks and transition to portable cylinders um, wherever that's possible. Next slide. And then, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's a great deal of solid waste in hospitals, and especially in the OR and perioperative setting. Um, much of this is due to the need for individually packed and sterile items. So of course, we need to prioritize patient safety, infection prevention, and regulatory guidelines. But one major strategy for reducing waste is just simply reviewing uh, products and converting single-use items to reprocessable items where possible and eliminating items that are not used. There's also a pretty good opportunity for recycling in the OR setting. Um, some items that can be recycled, of course, being mindful of how these are recycled, are blue wrap, plastic irrigation bottles, and the loads of clear plastic packaging and soft plastic tubing. Next slide. And the next solution I'll discuss is energy efficiency. Um, energy efficiency is a very high cost savings and re reducing environmental impact solution. ORs are the most energy intensive area within hospitals. Um, this can be attributed to the long working hours, the need for bright lighting and lots of energy consuming equipment like radiation or radiology equipment. One effective way to reduce energy is to reduce air exchanges in the OR suites. Air exchanges are often set much higher than regulatory standards, um, so they can be reduced to standard required levels. They can also be reduced when ORs are not in use um, or overnight, and use, you can use automated systems to do that turning off and turning on. Lighting is another opportunity for reducing energy use and has the co-benefit of major cost savings. Simply turning off the lights when unneeded is a good solution. Um, swapping out fluorescent and incandescent bulbs for energy efficient LED lighting is also a solution to reduce energy by nearly 50% in areas where there's total LED retrofit opportunity. Um, and then turning off and unplugging equipment when unused will result in energy savings, of course as well as turning off vacuums and medical air when not in use. Next slide. Green teams have been shown to aid in organizing and driving green initiatives in the OR and in other hospital settings. Um, green teams can provide leadership for climate action initiatives and engage other frontline staff, uh, foster collaboration, and can do things like provide education and awareness around sustainability initiatives. They can also be a hub for transdisciplinary collaboration, engaging stakeholders and subject matter experts outside of healthcare system. Next slide. Uh, last on climate smart solutions, measuring and reducing carbon emissions is extremely an extremely important part of this work um, that's connected to all the solutions that I have just discussed. Measuring baseline carbon emissions provides a comparison for all carbon reduction initiatives or improvements. Greenhouse gas emissions are measured in three scopes. Scope one, which includes on-site fossil fuels combusted, um, such as fleet vehicles and natural gas. Scope two includes purchased utilities, such as electricity and steam. And scope three includes sources not owned or controlled. Uh, by the organization directly, such as employee commuting and supply procurement. So beginning with scope one and two carbon measure measurement and tracking, um, I recommend doing this initially and then scoping out to include scope three at a later date once scope one and two are tracked and measured um, reliably. It's important to track emissions continuously to monitor improvement and reductions. And it's also important to evaluate and consider reporting requirements specific to locations or organizations. Next slide. 
So I'll share a couple of uh, case studies just briefly. Um, the first is a program developed uh, at M Health Fairview, um, large health system in Minnesota and one of the largest private employers. Um, this was one of my projects. So it was nurse led, uh, it was a quality improvement project. Um, this health system had not previously measured or tracked their greenhouse gas emissions. So I developed an individualized tool and a program to track and measure all scope one and two emissions. And I did a very in-depth analysis of these emissions to scope the highest impacts solutions, um, which was a combination of wind, of LED retrofit, of solar energy, and peak demand management. Um, and peak demand management was more of a cost savings initiative to filter into the subsequent uh, improvements. Um, and we ended up developing a feasible plan to reduce emissions by 21% in the first year with a further reduction thereafter and also um, a cost savings of over $150,000 per year and over 3 million in 30 years. And another um, case study is reducing desflurane. So I have been leading um, a team participating in the Institute for Healthcare Improvements inaugural um, decarbonizing healthcare work group, which is a work group of 14 health systems nationally working to um, implement sustainability solutions to see the highest impacts within the year. So within the calendar year of 2023. We focused on reducing desflurane at the beginning of the year in January. Um, only one of our 13 ORs did not use desflurane. Now, um, eight of our 13 ORs have eliminated desflurane, and we have reduced it significantly within the system um, with further re reductions to come within the next year. Next slide, please. Um, and here I've attached a link to um, the academic article on developing a program to measure and reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a major academic medical center. And next slide. And here you can see that system reduction in the desflurane gas of that desflurane case study that I shared. Time is almost up um, and we've cut that by about half in the year. Next slide. And this is just some photos of other ways that we've engaged health systems in um, climate smart healthcare. Um, one is a climate action bicycle ride, which is a partnership between two health systems and was sponsored by Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate. We've done this two years and then would invite partners across Minnesota um, in 2024 and other years to come. Um, this is a bicycle ride from institution to institution, and we involve community members and health professionals and talk about um, the impacts of climate change on pediatric health. Next slide. So health professionals can help people understand how individual family and community climate work collectively ameliorates climate change. And this is why it's so important for us to do this work. Next slide. Um, I am leading a health professional for healthy climate, climate smart healthcare work group. Um, this is really in the work. So right now we're in the process of developing the work group. The aim is to engage and support clinicians and health professionals in healthcare sustainability initiatives and offer tools and resources to support this work. Um, I'm currently seeking interested health professionals please do send me an email to indicate interest. We'll be surveying for the best meeting times and our first meeting will be in January of the new year. And there's my email. Next slide. And then we'll open it up for questions and I have included references that you can review on your own after. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. Um, and thanks everybody for your attention. I've noticed that we've already got some questions in the chat that have 
a lot to do with climate smart, health, smart healthcare. And I know that um, Lacey will also be able to go around to the audience, I believe, for anybody who has any questions. Um, if you like, I can go ahead and get started with uh, reading these questions that were in the chat. Um, so we have, I recently witnessed hospital nurse throw away an unopened IV kit. I asked why, and she said it had been contaminated by being in a patient room and could not be returned to inventory. That when it was in a sterile st sealed package. Um, also threw away an electric fan that had been offered to the patient but not used. The fan was clearly never used with the bound cord and factory labels attached. She said it could not be sterilized. I took it and gave it away. So why can't these items be re-sterilized by, for instance, UV light before returning it to the inventory? What do you have to say, Joe? Yeah, we see this all the time. I think if we collected just those wasted items, such as the unopened IV kit, um, we would have a huge pile, right? More than a huge pile. At my health system, we do donate these sorts of things. We collect the unopened IV kits. We collect fans, for example, um, within our supply department, and we do send them to Matter, which is a nonprofit um, that sends them overseas and to other places that are in need of these supplies. Some of them can be wiped um, and recirculated. Um, we often use our supply department to send things like fans to, which are re-sterilized and then used within our hospital. We don't broadly use UV light um, for sterilization at my health system, and we really base that on our infection prevention guidelines within our health system, which are based on national guidelines. Awesome. <clears throat> Super helpful. There's also some more here about um, unasked for plastic devices that are sent home with patients and presumably later tossed. Um, and the amount of disposed plastic is deplorable. Even a simple clip for a tube cannot be used twice. And is this waste being addressed beyond the points you may have already covered? Yeah, it's certainly being addressed on a larger scale, and there are many campaigns to reduce plastic waste. I'd be happy to share a webinar that uh, myself and Dr. Teddy Potter and a uh, plastics expert from Practice Green Health participated in for earthday.org. Um, and I'll share that resource because that touches on a lot of what you mentioned there. Awesome. Thanks. Love to open it up to other questions if there's folks on the uh, Zoom that want to throw things in the chat. And also, Lacey, if you're out there with further questions. I am. Can you hear me now? Did I solve this problem? Um, okay, awesome. So we've got a question from Sharon. Two questions, actually. Um, the third Tuesday? You gave the email address keishugar47 at gmail. Is it the third Tuesday? Kathleen? What are policy meetings, oh, Kathleen? yeah, that's correct. Yeah, the third Tuesday. Got it. And what is line? Oh, was your question, what is line three? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so line three was a, um, well, is a tar sands oil pipeline. So it, it transports um, oil that has been extracted from the tar sand oil lands in Alberta, Canada, um, transports it all the way there to the shipping terminal that's at the like Duluth Superior Harbor here. Um, these are operated by a company known as Enbridge. They're specifically just in that transport aspect of things. Um, they have a number of different pipelines that are involved in transporting these tar sands oil product. And um, they wanted to build a pipeline that they build as a replacement for a failing line three, so a replacement pipeline. However, it crossed, it had to actually go through a new route across the state and cross 330 miles of virgin territory, as it were, including wetlands, um, you know, watersheds, uh, the headwaters of the Mississippi River. <laughs> so there was a lot of objection to the construction of this pipeline because of its potential impacts on water resources and the fact that, you know, there was going to be all of this new construction um, and um, that a lot of it directly went across Indigenous treaty lands. And so the um, similar to folks might be aware of protests in Standing Rock um, against uh, other um, tar sands oil pipelines and the Keystone XL pipeline. So um, this was a very similar issue that was um, a, a big environmental health concern in Minnesota over the past couple of years. 
there was actually a very long process of opposition to this pipeline over a seven year time span. Um, ultimately, all the permits were approved despite the best efforts of many to oppose and ask our decision makers and authorities to deny permits for this. Um, so the pipeline was constructed and is in operation currently. Um, and ultimately, the amount of oil that can now be extracted and transported and shipped out and, and used will um, add to our greenhouse gas emissions by an amount equivalent to if we had built 50 new coal-fired power plants. So a big climate issue, um, big threat. <clears throat> and um, I guess the opposition isn't, continue, isn't done. Um, people are still working to see about getting these things shut down. And of course, everything that we do to advocate for a transition to um, carbon-free energy is important. But this is why we talked about um, false climate solutions, the need to stop all expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure and infrastructure that um, helps to you know, keep fossil fuels um, in use. We really need to be thinking um, about transitioning away from that as much as possible. So hopefully that answers the question, probably more information than you needed. Wow, I thought that was like an incredibly succinct and like off, off answer to that question. Thank you for being able to do that so powerfully. Um, so does anyone else have a question? If not, I'll ask the final question. I'm just curious what y'all would say is the biggest challenge in your work. I mean, I'm, I have an assumption maybe that it's apathy or I'm, I'm just curious, like, you know, what are the barriers to you making progress as you perceive them? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what everybody has to, to say on that. So I'll cede to uh, Kathleen and Joe first. Well, I, I'll just uh, mention that one of the challenges is health professionals who are working are very busy and it's really hard to get their attention. So we end up with a lot of reti retired health professionals or people that work part-time. Um, so th that's the challenge, which is why we we try to help people if somebody wants to write an, an op-ed or an LTE, we'll help them out because we know people are busy. Yeah, I think for me, it's that there's not always uh, open and, and broadly open channels to do the work. So really you're having to pave the way and, you know, really push your way through to open those channels to do the work, which I would attribute to a lack of awareness of the health impacts of climate change very broadly. Yeah. And, um, I guess I'll add to that by circling back to um, what I brought up at the beginning was this concept of um, when we're all dealing with the overwhelmingness of the climate crisis, um, once we are able to move people to awareness, there can be that sense of it's too big, you know, we can't tackle it, especially when we're thinking about things that are so institutionalized, right? So this talk about trying to transform the healthcare sector, um, I mean, they're very steeped in a culture that's about, you know, thinking about things in, in terms of cutting costs and, you know, all, all of this. And so, you know, trying to get in there and change institutions can be difficult. I work again in academia and trying to um, convince folks that we need to include information about climate change in the curriculum that's already overloaded with, you know, so much, there's so much that health professionals have to learn in their training programs. It's a tough sell sometimes to be like, yes, this is it's important. We have to include it. And then, and then yes, again, like once we are including it, it's like where to start. It's huge. It's overwhelming. Um, you know, people can get burned out um, very easily and fall into that sense of anxiety and, and grief. Um, so we're always trying to figure out where's that balance if we're asking folks who are already busy and and overwhelmed and dealing with like just this information dump and all the duties that they have um, as health professionals you know how can we say that there's benefits to also caring about climate change and engaging in action you know what's the value added to you um but i think it just comes back again to like we we need to do this right the the value added is that this is part of um, what it means to be a health professional, right? We you know, we care about health. We come together um, to help to improve lives. Um, and with climate change being the greatest uh, global health threat um, of our lifetimes, you know, this is work that we need to do. And if we come together and work on it together, then that makes it 
much more feasible and also makes it part of the solution for us individually to be able to keep going. Fair and well said. Thank you so much, Brenna, Joe, Kathleen. Thank you, Barb Jones, for helping make this happen. Um, we really appreciated learning from you today.